don't know me, my name's Claire, I'm a new neonatal consultant at the Homerton um, and I've been asked to talk to you about the floppy baby. Um, so first things for today, I'm sure most of you are more familiar than me with this current uh, setup, but first of all, if there are any problems, so if you can't hear me or the connection goes in and out, would you just put it on the chat so that I know that there's a problem? Or if you're from the Homerton, then you can just text me and then I will see one of the two options. Uh, I have made it interactive, so there are questions and there are cases. If you could use the chat function to reply to me, that would be great. Um, and I'm sure you know there's a bit of a delay with the chat function, um, so we will give time for people to answer. There's quite a lot of you and more arriving, so you just make sure that all your microphones are muted so that we don't have that annoying echo. And I have started recording the talks that will be available on your YouTube link. Um, and I've been asked to remind you to please provide the feedback for the London School of Pediatrics, which is on the Excel spreadsheet and the link is below. And just one last thing, I've got a very cute dog working at home, um, but he barks a lot with the Zoom. Um, so I put him in another room, but apologies in advance if you do hear him barking and I have to go and make him be quiet. Okay, so. What I want to try and do for you guys today um, is to achieve these five aims. So for you to be able to recognize the floppy infant on examination, for you to develop a logical neuroanatomical approach to the floppy baby, to know the common causes of hypotonia, and to be able to understand how to differentiate the central and peripheral causes, and then to understand how to start investigating the floppy baby. Okay, so the first part of our interactive um, is so there are five babies on here and the numbers of the pictures are at the top left. Um, can you tell me which baby is not floppy and why? And if you do it on your chat function, and I'll wait a little while just to see what everyone's thoughts are. So if you look at those five pictures, which baby do we think is not floppy? Yeah, so we've got some answers coming through. And can you tell me why? So, so far you're all right, but I want to know why we think that one. Yeah. Okay, really well done, guys. Um, so yeah, you're right. Number one is the baby that's not floppy. Um, and that's for the reasons that you've all said. So they've got a nice flexed posture with flexed arms and legs. And although it's not a moving, it's a still photo, you could imagine that there are anti-gravity movements because the hand has been held up by the face. And so is the age of the baby important? So I want you to all look at picture two, which is the baby that's being held in ventral suspension. If I said to you that that baby was, let's say four weeks old, would we think that that was okay? Versus if I said to you that that baby was actually 16 weeks old. So I know it looks more like one age than the other, but tell me if you think it would be normal for a four week old or normal for a 16 week old. Yeah, so we've got some answers coming through on the chat. I'll just give you a couple of seconds more to think about it because there's a few people that have just joined. Yeah, okay. So the reason that um, age is important is that you need to think about where the development would be. And so when you held in ventral suspension, you expect to see some head lag in the first month of life like that. But once you get beyond about four weeks and definitely six weeks, the baby should be able to hold their head level um, so that it would be level with the back. And then once you get above three months, so 12 weeks, the baby, when they're put in ventral suspension, should be able to hold the head above the midline. So you were all right in saying that it's definitely um, abnormal for the baby that's over three months of age but it still might be abnormal for four weeks of life if the baby never tries to bring the head up slightly. And if you look at picture five, which is the baby that's been pulled up from lying down up towards sitting, 
what tells you that that baby is floppy other than the head lag that you can see? There's some other clue in what that baby is doing. Anyone know what the baby's doing, which tells you that they're definitely floppy compared to if they, when you just look at the head? Yeah, well done. Um, so for those of you that have said it, it's pay particular attention to the arm position. So when you're assessing a baby for this and you pull them up from their arms, they should bend their elbows because they're resisting you. And a baby that has the straight elbows, there's no resistance, which shows that they're very floppy. And one last thing to remember is that your gestational age is important. So obviously if you're born at 23 weeks versus born at 33 weeks, your baseline tone for your gestation, you're gonna be more floppy the more immature you are. Okay, so we're gonna talk about the floppy baby. So the floppy baby is common and tone is the resistance of a muscle to stretch. And to maintain normal tone, you need both an intact central and peripheral nervous system. And the bit that makes the floppy baby quite daunting is there's lots of different causes and it's normally the fine print in your textbook. And there's lots of investigations you could do. So it can seem really difficult, but hopefully in the next kind of 50 minutes or so, I'm gonna show you that it can be relatively straightforward and hopefully you can use what you learn from this talk to make it a bit easier. So there's two main categories that cause a floppy baby, central causes and peripheral causes. And by far the most common accounting for up to 80% are central causes. In terms of being more specific for the differential diagnosis, we need to think about our neuroanatomy. So back to the questions, in a floppy baby, in the anatomy, where could the problem be? So if you're trying to think about why a baby is floppy, where might the problem be in terms of their anatomy? Give me some answers on the chat. And not conditions, just the anatomy. Yep, yeah, well done. So perfect. So the answers coming through are exactly what I wanted. So um, people are suggesting spinal, brain, neuromuscular junction, motor cortex. Great. So if I show you your neuroanatomy. Oh, bear with me one second. Here. So you've got the brain and think about the brain as the cortex, the white matter, the gray matter, the basal ganglia and the brain stem, the spine. And then you've got anterior horn cell, peripheral nerves, neuromuscular junction, and muscle. And for any floppy baby, the problem could lie in any of those areas. If it's in the brain or the spine, then it's the central cause, which remember is the most common. And if it's the anterior horn cell or below, then it's a peripheral cause. Okay, so you've been asked to review a floppy baby on the postnatal ward. Um, and you've just been asked to go and examine them. Tell me what sort of things you're going to look for on examination that might give you a clue as to what's wrong with them or just how you would do an examination to check if a baby was floppy. So shall we check the reflexes? Um, yeah, so for whoever that is, really good. Um, just for the purpose of this, because there's quite a lot of people joined in, if you can just type your responses in the chat function, which you should see as a speech bubble in the top right. Yeah, well done. So, so far we've got things like look for reflexes, look for weakness, tone, posture, dysmorphism, general examination. Okay, really well done, guys. So this is what you want to look for. So you want to look at the baby at rest um, and see the position of the limbs, whether there's any spontaneous movements, whether the baby's making any anti-gravity movements. And if they are, whether the movements are in all four limbs or just in the upper limbs or the lower limbs, then look at the baby's face. So it's important to look at their expression. So do they look nice and alert or do they look um, like they're a bit sleepy? 
In terms of their eyes, have they got droopy eyelids? And in terms of their mouth, have they got an excessive amount of secretions? And you might want to examine their suck as well. In general, you want to know if they look a bit lethargic, dysmorphic, as some of you said, and it's important to measure their head circumference and plot it on the growth chart with their weight. You want to particularly look at their respiratory function and ever, whether there's any work of breathing, and we'll come back to that in our cases. And then in terms of the neurological examination, you want to look at the tone in all four limbs and the central tone. So you want to examine the baby in ventral suspension. So that's like that picture that we saw in the first slide with the baby that's held upside down on the head. You want to examine the reflexes, so the suck, morrow, plantar and palmar grasp, biceps patella, and then whether there's any clonus. So if you've never looked for clonus in a baby before, you're just going to hold the shin very gently and rotate the, angle, the ankle about three or four times in a circle and then push it back so that the foot is flexed. And if there's clonus, you'll feel beats against your hand. It's also important to look at the pupils. So you want to look at the size of them and also whether they're reacting to light. And then other things, is the baby having any seizures? Are there any contractures? and then perform a full systems examination. Uh, and for those of you that have been um, more thorough on the chat, so people have suggested doing things like the Hammersmith exam, uh, and there's the Dubovitz as well. Yes, that can help you assess whether the baby that you're looking at has the appropriate movement specific for their gestation. Um, but in terms of reviewing a baby in the middle of the night or acutely on the ward for hypotonia, then if you do all of these things, then you'll be able to find the answer. Okay, so in terms of central causes, and you've just examined the baby, what makes you think that they might have a central cause compared to a peripheral cause? Um, there's a question about the Hammersmith exam, and um, we'll come back to it at the end. Uh, so just in terms of if you're examining a baby, what makes you think they've got a central cause and not a peripheral cause? So yeah, we're getting things like high reflexes, brisk reflexes, sorry, um, reduced alertness, poor suck, exaggerated reflexes, face involvement. Okay, great. So I'm gonna hopefully give you a way to remember this a bit easier. So in central causes, you want to think about actually the baby's strong. So they may be floppy, but their power is preserved and they have reasonable anti-gravity movements. So a nice mnemonic to try and help you remember that is using strong. So they've got systemic features and that might include deranged blood tests such as liver function or kidney function. They might be having apneas. They might have abnormal eye movements. T is for tired or lethargic, which means that they're showing signs of encephalopathy. R for reflexes that are brisk, which most of you said, well done. O for OFC, so you want to measure their head circumference and see whether they've got evidence of microcephaly or macrocephaly. N, neurophysiology, so looking for whether they've got any evidence of seizures, any dystonia, any abnormal movements. And G is genetic, so you're looking for any dysmorphic features. And so the baby may well be floppy, as some of you said on the chat, but floppiness in isolation doesn't tell you whether it's a central or peripheral cause. If you want to know whether it's central, you need to be looking out for all of these things on your examination. And if we go back to our neuroanatomy, the central causes we're thinking of are causes in the brain and causes in the spine. So now getting to some conditions, what central causes of a floppy baby do you guys know? Yeah, well done. So things coming through on the text are um, trisomy 21, HIE, uh, metabolic conditions, stroke, IVH, sepsis, and then they're flowing through with lots of people coming up with the same things. Great. And so now I'm just gonna give you a way of remembering it a bit systematically. Um, and just if you've got your phone on you, if you just screenshot the flowchart because you'll need it later for the cases. Um, so if you've got essential cause, you want to work out whether the baby is encephalopathic or whether the baby is dysmorphic. And then depending on which of those you've seen, you can then go down um, the flowchart. 
So if they're encephalopathic and not dysmorphic, then you want to check if there's a history of HIE, and if there is, the most likely thing is HIE. If there's no history of HIE, then you'd be thinking about all the things you all mentioned, so sepsis, metabolic, stroke, and intracranial hemorrhage. But just remember that things like sepsis, so for example, GBS sepsis, could precipitate HIE. If they're dysmorphic and not encephalopathic, then you're thinking about a genetic syndrome, of which most of you um, use trisomy 21 as your example. There are others, but I'm not going to give it away because we use them in the case discussions later. And if they're not encephalopathic and um, dysmorphic, then you're thinking more along the lines of structural brain abnormalities. And by that, I mean things like lithencephaly, schizencephaly. OK, so the commonest central cause is HIE. And we know the commonest cause of a floppy baby is the central cause. So by far and away, the commonest reason for you to see a floppy baby um, is HIE. So always look for evidence of this in the history. Even if someone hands over to you, oh, there was no evidence of HIE. Make sure you check the details at birth, the core gases, APGARs, and the level of resuscitation. And the investigations in a central cause depend on the most likely cause. And the main thing to remember in these floppy babies is don't just do everything. So generally, like most things in babies, you always consider infection. So most of these babies will have a septic screen. And then depending what you think the most likely cause is, so HOE, you need an MRI to diagnose that. The sepsis, they don't just think about bacterial, so you may want to do viral studies or torch. The metabolic, that's always the dreaded one with the numerous investigations to send, but you can start with just the baseline screen. And a baseline screen would normally consist of ammonia, acetylcholine, urine organic acids, and plasma amino acids. And if you're thinking metabolic, it's important to check the thyroid function and to get an ophthalmology review, because a lot of metabolic conditions have signs in the eye, such as cataracts. And if you think there's been a stroke or an intracranial hemorrhage, then obviously you'd have a head scan, plus or minus an MRI. And again, look for clues in the history. So HIE, as we said, um, whether there's infection risk factors in the history. Um, and it is rare that things like a spinal cord injury can happen at birth. And you'd want to look for things in the history that might precipitate that. So if it's a breach delivery, very difficult extraction, forceps, big baby, lots of twisting movements, then just bear, bear that in the back of your mind. OK, so we had strong for central causes. What makes you think when you're examining that baby on the postnatal ward that this time they've got a peripheral cause and not a central cause? So if you have a go on the chat telling me what you think might make it more likely peripheral. Yeah, so so far we've got coming in pretty much like everyone, absent reflexes. Yeah, uh, lack of spontaneous movements. Yeah, lack of reflexes. And someone is um, putting about uh, distal versus proximal weakness, which we will come back to on our um, Flow charts and really well done for those of you that are commenting on the fact that the baby has an alert face. Okay, so in terms of helping you remember it, so they're weak, so they've got reduced power. So W means weak or absent reflexes or weak or absent anti gravity movements. E for expression, i.e., they're alert and they've got facial signs. A to remind you that they're alert. And K is kin. So you want to remember in these babies that there may be a maternal medical history that might be relevant. And other things to look for are possible fasciculations, particularly of the tongue. If contractures are present, then this suggests a neuromuscular cause. And there's slightly different clues in the history for some of the peripheral causes. So in particular, you want to ask the parents whether there's a history of reduced fetal movements or if the scan showed polyhydramnios. And just a reminder, for all the peripheral causes, the problem could be the anterior horn cell, the peripheral nerves, neuromuscular junction, or the muscle. So bearing that in mind, what conditions do you guys know that will cause peripheral causes of a floppy baby? So if you put them on the chat. Yeah, so I think pretty much in every time I've done a talk like this, SMA is the one that comes up. Uh, well done. Someone's different with congenital myasthenia. Yeah, well done, guys. 
So generally, these are the ones you know because they're exam topics, but they're actually the hardest ones to diagnose. Um, and a differential diagnosis for the peripheral causes is, again, thinking about your neuroanatomy. So in the anterior horn cell, as you all said, thinking about spinal muscular atrophy. The other one which is common for exams is botulism. Um, we don't tend to see that. In the nerves, think about whether there's been a neuropathy. At the neuromuscular junction, whether there's myasthenia gravis or congenital myasthenic syndromes. In the muscle, lots of things can happen to the muscle. Myotonic dystrophy, muscular dystrophy, congenital myopathy and metabolic myopathy. And what's important to remember with the peripheral causes is that there's lots of differentials within each section and lots of them have really complicated names, but you don't need to learn this. You need to learn how to recognize each subgroup. And remember the commonest causes of peripheral, although overall these are still rare, are the congenital myopathies, congenital myotonic dystrophy and spinal muscular atrophy. And so if we go to the next flow chart for the peripheral causes, again, if you've got your phone, just take a screenshot of this because it will help you for the cases later. And this helps you work through, once you've decided on your examination that it's a peripheral cause, the sorts of tests you need to think about doing. And the most important one is your creatinine kinase. And if your creatinine kinase comes back as abnormal, that tends you down one route of the flow chart to the left of your screen. And if it's normal, you go down to the right. The other important thing with creatinine kinase is to remember there's a whole host of reasons why it might be high that may have nothing to do with the muscle. So for example, post HIE, the CK can be high. If you've got a hemolyzed sample, the CK can be high. So the first thing is to repeat any abnormal CK result. And if your creatinine kinase on the repeat is abnormally high, then you're going along the lines of congenital muscular dystrophy. And then that's where it gets a little bit complicated, but you just need to remember once you think it's a congenital muscular dystrophy, there are various investigations depending on whether there are central signs or eye signs, including biopsies, genetics, looking at the eyes and an MRI. If your creatinine kinase is normal, then you want to look at whether there are systemic signs or not. And by systemic signs, we mean, is the lactate high? Is there any cardiac pathology? Is there any hepatosplenomegaly? And if there are systemic signs, then you think about metabolic, the commonest ones being pompase. And if there are no systemic signs, this is where what a couple of you commented on your examination, whether there's proximal or distal weakness more than the other becomes important. And again, you don't need to worry about learning this flowchart off by heart. It's just a guide to help you. So if you think there's more proximal weakness than distal weakness, the next thing you need to work out is whether the eye movements are okay or whether there's ptosis. If the eye movements are fine, you think about congenital myopathy. If there are ptosis or weakness in the eye movements, you think about congenital myasthenic syndrome. And you also need to bear in mind whether mother has any features. So these could be of myotonic dystrophy or myasthenia gravis, which we'll go into in the cases. And the third thing for peripheral is if you think the baby's got spinal muscular atrophy because it's a fairly classical phenotype, then you would send off the SMA genetics for that. And the investigations depend on the likely cause, as I was saying. So the first step is creatinine kinase and repeat it if it's abnormally high before acting on it. If you think they've got SMA, do the SMA gene. If you think they've got myasthenia gravis, then it's things like maternal antibodies, neostigmine tests, nerve conduction studies. If you think it might be myotonic dystrophy, then there's a myotonic dystrophy gene. For congenital myopathy, think about EMG, muscle biopsy, and genetics. For neuropathies, think about nerve conduction studies. And metabolic, think about the baseline metabolic screen or a specific screen. And for the more complicated congenital muscular dystrophies, then you've got the more um, invasive tests. And the main thing to remember is you wouldn't be doing all of these tests in isolation. You'd be speaking to the relevant neuromuscular team for where you work, who would help guide you through which of these to do in which order. OK, so for the second half of the talk, we're just going to go through cases which put these approaches into practice, but also highlight some of the important causes of floppy infants and then their features. So hopefully you managed to screenshot the flowcharts. If not, hopefully you can remember them. Um, and for each case, I want you to ask yourself 
whether you think it's a central or peripheral cause and what makes you think that, depending on what your answer is to that, what could be the cause, and then what tests you would do to confirm the diagnosis. And you can tell me the answers on the chat function. So case number one is a 41 week baby born by spontaneous vaginal delivery. There was a concern throughout pregnancy <clears throat> that there was generally reduced fetal movements. And when you examine the baby, you think they're floppy and weak, and you do think the weakness is more pronounced in the proximal muscles than the distal. When you look at them, they've actually got the frog leg position. Um, so if you think back to the slides that I showed you at the beginning of the pictures of the baby, that's where the baby's lying with the knees outstretched, so with the hips abducted. But they've got an alert face and they seem to be smiling and engaging with the parents. They've got absent reflexes, but you're concerned by their work of breathing and describe it as diaphragmatic. So for this baby, is it a central or peripheral cause and why? What do you think could be the cause and how are you going to confirm the diagnosis? Yeah, well done. So this is what I mean by FMA is the one that comes up most commonly because all of you pretty much have picked on that it's peripheral and pretty much everyone is suggesting um, that it's spinal muscular atrophy. Okay, so if we go through, um, so you think it's a peripheral cause, the creatinine kinase was normal and you think they've got an SMA phenotype. So if you follow that flowchart, the first thing you're going to think about doing is doing the SMA gene. And just a little bit of a reminder about SMA. So for it to present this early in a baby, it's going to be type 0 or 1. So autosomal recessive condition for the SMN1 gene, which is on chromosome 5. And most strikingly, they have a normal facial expression. Lots of people um, describe tongue fasciculation, but don't think that the absence of tongue fasciculation um, rules out SMA because it's only present in a third. They typically have diaphragmatic breathing and a bell-shaped chest, a reflexive, as you all suggested, and the main differential is congenital myopathy. And the reason that early diagnosis is important is that there's a new intrathecal treatment that can start um, as soon as possible after birth. Okay, next one, case two. So this is a 32 week old um, baby who was born by spontaneous vaginal delivery, normal scans, other than being a spontaneous onset of preterm labor, there were no risk factors for sepsis. On examination, the baby seems floppy, but strong. They're sleepy and lethargic, but rousable. They've got poor feeding, and the person who's examined them thought they looked slightly dysmorphic um, and described almond shaped eyes and bilateral undescended testes. So ask yourself, even if you think you know what the diagnosis is, is it central or peripheral and why? What would be the cause? And what tests would you do to confirm the diagnosis first? Yeah, well done guys. So um, pretty much everyone is saying central or genetic. And um, people are commenting that it's most likely a syndrome of which some of you have come up with the syndrome that it is, which we'll get to in a minute. So if we go to the questions in blue, this just reminds you about a preterm baby. So you just need to remember, would you say that could be normal for a preterm 32 weeker? Probably not, because you wouldn't describe every 32 weeker as that floppy. And bearing in mind that they're floppy and not they're difficult to rouse and lethargic. If I only let you do one test, and it's not to do with working out the genetic cause, what quick test should you do first in this baby? Okay, and the reason I put this in is because when we do a talk on any fancy things like metabolic or neuro, um, you go straight for the workup for neuromuscular. And actually, you need to just remember what you would do on the postnatal ward, which some of you have got. So if you're asked to review a baby that's floppy, poor feeding, things a bit lethargic, regardless of whether you think there's a neurological condition or not, the first thing this baby needs is a blood sugar or a gas, because it may just be that they're hypoglycemic and that's why they're appearing floppy and lethargic. But in this case, for the couple of you that put it, um, we go back to our central cause. Um, so if you flip down, actually this baby appears encephalopathic and dysmorphic. But the reason they're encephalopathic 
is because of the low blood sugar, not because there's true encephalopathy. So it can actually confuse you, but they actually fall into the central category of being dysmorphic and not encephalopathic. And for those of you that got it really well done, for those of you that didn't, um, we're just going to go through. So this is one of the commonest genetic conditions causing hypotonia, in addition to Down syndrome that you all said at the beginning, the Prader-Willi syndrome. And again, it comes up a lot in exams because it's a uh, um, difficult genetics and it's to do with methylation studies on chromosome 15 um, and it involves genetic imprinting. Um, and most of it, like 70% of the cases, um, occur when the segment of the paternal chromosome is deleted. But you can get some cases where you get uniparental disomy and that's come from the mum. So where both copies of chromosome 15 come from the mum rather than one from each. In a baby, it tends to present as hypotonia, feeding difficulties, poor growth and delayed development. And then once they get to childhood age, they have an insatiable appetite, hyperphagia and obesity. And as they get older, they have mild to moderate um, intellectual impairment and learning disability. So it is a significant cause of delayed development. And it has quite a distinctive facial features and phenotype. Um, typically, um, they're always fair haired babies described as almond shaped eyes with triangular mouth. And one kind of clue to help you with this diagnosis is if that there are undescended testes bilaterally in a floppy baby, and you should think about Prader-Willi syndrome until proven otherwise. Okay, case three. So there's a 39 week old baby and um, uneventful history until actually when you specifically ask the parents, they say, oh, do you know what? I think there were reduced fetal movements compared to our previous child. And when you examine this baby, you think they're weak. There's no anti-gravity power in the legs. Um, you can see contractions. Um, particularly of the legs and you can see tailor fees and actually you had to bring this baby around to the neonatal unit and start them on vapotherm because of their respiratory distress and also they're not feeding well so you had to start ng tube fees so rather than jump straight to the diagnosis that you may or may not know do you think that it's essential or peripheral cause in which case what do you think might be the cause and what test would you do to confirm the diagnosis so we've got a bit of a mixed response to see whether it's central or peripheral. I would say just about more peripheral coming through now. Um, and most people are saying to do the creatinine kinase first. Um, and there are a couple of people who've come up with a diagnosis. Okay, so that if there's anything else you would like to know, so there is one thing you could do that could help you with the diagnosis, of which one of you has said it in your answer already. So if you could do one thing, might be to do with the baby, might be to do with the parents, what could you do? Yeah, well done. So you wanna look at the mum. So this is where in the peripheral causes, the kin factor becomes important. So yeah, maternal handshake and look at the mum's faces. So again, if we go through the flowchart, so you think it's peripheral. Um, when you do your creatinine kinase, it's normal. When you examine the baby, there's no systemic signs. But actually, when you examine the mother, you think actually she might have the myotonic faces. Um, and the classic of when you shake her hand, she finds it difficult to relax the hand grip. Again, you see that quite commonly in exams. Um, if you've never done it before, it is actually really true and really obvious. So we had one baby a couple of years ago um, and when you shook the mum's hand, it was really obvious that she couldn't let go of the grip. So it's always worth doing if you're querying a peripheral cause and concerned that there might be some maternal features. So this was congenital myoclonic dystrophy. Really well done to the people that got it. And um, most important thing is to examine the mother. Um, so she already will have symptoms of the myotonic dystrophy, but she may not know about it. It's very rare to get passed on by the father, and it's autosomal dominant on chromosome 19, and it's to do with the CTG triplet repeat. And what points to myotonic dystrophy is the triad of features that this baby had. So talipes, contractures, and respiratory problems in a baby is myotonic dystrophy until proven otherwise. 
So these little clues in the cases help you um, in the future pinpoint what would be the most likely cause. So just a reminder, myotonic means involving muscle tone and dystrophy means wasting away. And they tend to prevent, as well as being the floppy infant, but they have respiratory distress after delivery with lots of secretions. However, after the first month of life, their respiratory problems tend to improve. Um, they're floppy from birth, but again, this improves with age and physiotherapy is really helpful for this. They commonly have facial weakness and a lack of facial expression, but it's important to distinguish this from an unresponsive baby. So they are responsive, it's just that they have facial weakness. Okay, case four. So we've got a four day old term baby um, who presented to Skaboo uh, initially with poor feeding. And you do the examination and you find that the OFC is well above the 99th centile with the birth weight on the 50th. They don't appear to be trying to fix and follow. They seem weak with reduced anti-gravity movements. There's the frog leg position on lying flat. So you see some contractures of the lower limbs. And when you put the CFM on, you see seizures on the CFM. So firstly, has this baby got a central cause or a peripheral cause and why? So, so far, pretty much everyone is coming up with central. And for all the reasons you said that there are seizures and macrocephaly. Okay, and what do you think the cause might be? So a few of you are saying metabolic. Yep, yeah, HIE has got to be in there because you're saying that it's a central cause. Yeah, okay. So the thing to remember with this baby is actually um, that they had central and peripheral signs. So you're right that they had central signs because of the macrocephaly and the seizures, but don't forget that you said that they were weak, they had reduced anti-gravity movements and a frog leg position, and that wouldn't fit with a central cause. So actually, this baby has what we call a double hit. So they've got central and peripheral signs. And for this particular baby, their MRI showed Lee's encephaly, um, so a structural brain defect, and their keratinine kinase was high, which um, they went on to have a diagnosis of congenital muscular dystrophy as well. And it's just important to show that it's not impossible to get a central and a peripheral cause, particularly, for example, if you have a peripheral cause like SMA, but the baby's also suffered HIE or suffering with an infection. And as someone has just put on the chat, it's the history that's really important. And also, in addition to that, your neuro examination is so helpful with deciding whether it's a central or peripheral cause. So if you think there's both central and peripheral um, causes from your examination, then it doesn't mean your examination is wrong. Just remember, they might have a double hit. OK, next one. Case five. So it's a 40 week old, uh, 40 week gestation, sorry, pregnant lady who presented to labor ward with a fetal bradycardia and there was a decision for a crash emergency section. And um, mother spiked the temperature to 38.5 degrees and let's assume this was pre the COVID era. Um, and she was known to be a GBS carrier. The baby was born in poor condition and had APGARs of two, four and six um, and required intubation at birth. The cord gas arterial pH was 6.8 with a basic set of minus 22. So they were intubated and admitted to NICU. They had seizures on their CFM and were loaded with phenobarbitone. And then your colleague examined them and described them as hypotonic and lethargic. So is this gonna be a central or peripheral cause? Yeah, well done. So coming through on the chat, pretty much everyone is saying central and really nice people have put the differential as HIE or sepsis. Perfect. Um, and what tests would you do to confirm the cause then if you think it was either HIE or sepsis? Yeah, so you do cranial ultrasound, think about an MRI and a septic screen. Okay, great. So yeah, you guys were right. We've gone for central. The baby was encephalopathic and not dysmorphic. And there was a clear history of HIE. And we know HIE is the commonest cause of the central causes of hypertonia. 
And you were right, this was a central cause and it was HIE secondary to GBS sepsis. So you can have more than one central cause. And as we all know, HIE and sepsis can coexist. And as you all said, you wanna do your septic screen um, and your MRI brain. And the one thing this case should also highlight to you is if you remember the order, they said there were seizures on the CFM, they gave the phenobarbitone, and then after they showed on the neuro examination um, that they seemed floppy and lethargic. And I just want to remind you all, not just for assessing the floppy baby, but also when you're doing your neuro exam for assessing babies for encephalopathy and whether they should have cooling therapy, is that your neuro examination is really important to be as early as possible. And ideally, before you've intubated them, which I know is difficult, but also definitely before you give them any anticonvulsants. It was very clear in this scenario, because the baby was fitting, but in some cases, you're unclear of what the baby's true neurological status is if you do the neuro examination only after you've given them some sedating medication. Okay, case six. So this is a 39 week old term infant. So you are called to review on day one um, and the midwife is really worried about what she describes as facial weakness and poor feeding. And mum has, she thinks an autoimmune disorder, uh, but she can't really remember any details and there's nothing written in the notes. And on examination, you find what looks like a well baby, but they've got a poor suck. Their eyelids are droopy, but they're able to smile and they can close their eyes. There's some increased work of breathing, but otherwise their systemic examination is unremarkable. But you find reduced tone in all four limbs and reduced spontaneous movements. So do we think this is a central cause or a peripheral cause? And what do we think it is? Okay, perfect. So coming through on the chat, pretty much everyone is saying peripheral. Um, and exactly what this case is designed to highlight is coming through with your answers. Because some of you are saying myasthenia gravis, uh, some of you are saying congenital myasthenia gravis, and some of you are saying transient neonatal myasthenia gravis. Um, so we need to clear up how you differentiate between the two. So let's assume you all think it is myasthenia gravis. Um, what test would you do to confirm the diagnosis? And obviously you've all decided that you think mum has the myasthenia gravis. Yep, so take a history from mum. And what's the test that you do? Yeah, okay, well done. So what this case is designed to highlight is the differences um, in the myasthenia gravis you can see in babies. Um, but first of all, just remind yourself of that flowchart and see how easy this makes things for you. So you all thought it was peripheral, so you would do your CK to start with. The CK comes back as normal. You decide there's no systemic signs, but mum does have features and she had an autoimmune disease. So you're thinking about myasthenia gravis. And when you examine the baby as well, you think um, you need to decide about the pattern of weakness to help you differentiate between whether it's transient neonatal myasthenia that's come from mum or whether it's the congenital myasthenic syndromes, which is a different entity. So if we start with transient neonatal myasthenia gravis, so it occurs in 10 to 30% of infants born to mothers with myasthenia, so it's not that rare. It's an autoimmune condition and it's caused by the transplacental passage of the IgG antibodies to the postsynaptic acetylcholine receptors. The so myasthenia gravis is all to do with the neuromuscular junction. So from your neuroanatomy, we know we're in a peripheral cause. It tends to produce transient signs. Normally they start on day one, but they can present any time in the first week. And when you examine them, they're going to have features of a peripheral cause. So they'll be weak. Um, in terms of treatment, they may need anticholinesterase, so it may be that they've not just got enough of the um, acetylcholine around, so anticholinesterase will increase it prior to feeding. However, the majority resolve spontaneously. On the flip side, if we look at congenital myasthenic syndromes, this is actually rare, um, so one in 200,000 chance of having it, and it's actually a genetic defect, not autoimmune. And it's to do with genetic defects at the neuromuscular junction. And it can be presynaptic, synaptic, or postsynaptic. 
Again, like the transient neonatal, the baby presents with the features of a peripheral cause, so they'll be weak on examination. But classically, they have the droopy eyelids, and the weakness begins in infancy. It typically begins in the first year rather than in the neonatal period. But it does progress with age and the weakness gets worse. And so does the eye movements and the fatigue. The treatment depends on the cause, so whether it's presynaptic, synaptic or postsynaptic. But there are various drug forms available. So just when you work out that you think there's a peripheral cause and you think that it might be something to do with myasthenia gravis, you just need to remember that there are two different entities that can affect babies. So transient neonatal myasthenic gravis only occurs in, in babies whose mums have myasthenia and it's the transplacental passage and it's autoimmune. Whereas the congenital myasthenic syndromes are much rarer, mum doesn't have to have myasthenia gravis and it's genetic due to defects in the um, neuromuscular junction. So I hope that going through those cases has helped put those into um, practice and makes it slightly easier to work out whether a baby is floppy or not. The most important thing to say is don't just go for what you think the diagnosis is. Um, you need to go through with your logical approach and use those flow charts to start with. Because sometimes you can think it's one thing, like SMA, you think they're floppy with an alert face, it's got to be SMA. But if you don't go through all the other features that we discussed and use the flowcharts, you might miss something else. So before we summarise what we've covered, um, are there any questions if we put them on the chat? So um, there's a question that says, do we need to screen asymptomatic babies born to mums with myasthenia gravis? So a really good question. Um, so you know um, that 10 to 30 percent uh, of women with myasthenia gravis will have the body cancer to their babies. And while it may present while the baby is still on the postnatal ward, it can present up to the first week of life. Um, and so what? while you don't need to screen asymptomatic on the phone, India. What? You don't need to screen asymptomatic babies routinely. What you do need to make sure is that the mum is given a to your Lego and I'm trying to listen. Can you not what symptoms uh, could be could occur? So for example, focusing on the eyelids and focusing on the poor feeding. Um, some units have a policy where they'll keep babies born to mums of myasthenia nigaris for at least 72 hours because that's the commonest time period that the symptoms present. Um, other units will do differently. But the main thing is to make sure that the mum knows that it's a possibility and to keep an eye What's out on the features. Um, someone has said, what is the significance of frog leg position? Why does it indicate peripheral abnormalities? Okay, good question. Um, so the frog leg position is all to do with the fact um, that in the peripheral causes, you don't have any resistance to tone. So whereas in the central causes, we said they'd be weak but strong, in the peripheral causes, they're weak. And if you took away any of your strength, anybody's limbs would rotate outwards into abduction for the hips. So typically in a baby, if you see them lying in the frog leg position, it generally means that it's a peripheral cause, because if it was a central cause, they would have some resistance to the tone and some of the anti-gravity movements. So they would be holding their legs straighter rather than bent out. Uh, next person has said, what about gut symptoms? Um, says that older children with myopathies and muscular dystrophies can have poor gut motility. Yep, really good. Um, in infants and children, you tend to see that. But in babies, you tend not to see those problems. If you think that most of these children will get diagnosed in the first few weeks of life, um, they tend not to present with the gut motility and they tend to present with the features of the floppy infant that we have described. But as they get older, you're right, they're going to have the problems with weakness, they may have respiratory difficulty, and you may find the gut motility. 
Uh, so someone's asked, is the near stigmin test valid for both transient and congenital myasthenia gravis? Um, so first thing to say is I am by no means an expert in myasthenia gravis, um, but if you think about what that test is doing, then it would work for transient and it would only work for the congenital myasthenia gravis um, where you've got the presynaptic or the synaptic problem. So the problem with the congenital myasthenia gravis is the defect could be presynaptic, synaptic or postsynaptic. And if you just do the near stigmin test, then you might miss one of the other causes. So if you think it's congenital myasthenia gravis, then um, you need to do the genetic test. And also, if you speak to your friendly neuromuscular um, doctor, uh, they'll be able to give much clearer advice. It is valid for both but a negative one doesn't mean that you ruled out congenital myasthenia. Um, okay, and there's a question about the Hammersmith neurological exam. So um, there's, uh, when babies are born, and for example, it's more common where you're unclear about what their gestation is, or for um, the therapists who are doing a formal um, developmental assessment, there are ways to look at whether baby's uh, presentation fits with their gestation or not. And there's the Hammersmith one and also the Dubovit. And in terms of what, um, for those of you that haven't seen it, I think the person that asked the question was unclear about the scoring, but essentially um, you're presented with a group of pictures, the various tests that you would do on examination. So let's take, for example, the um, pulling from lying to sitting and looking for whether the arm contracts or not. And it will have various pictures to give you a clue of around what gestation the baby would have different positions depending on their normal tone. And you go through, um, and certainly in the Dubovitz exam, you go through and circle where you think the baby is for each of those areas. And when you finish the exam, it's in columns with um, the most immature to the most mature from left to right. And you see roughly where all your circles are and it gives you a guide as to what gestation the baby you're looking at is. If you're using it for a floppy baby to assess how floppy they are, it's less helpful. It doesn't help you come up with a cause what it gives you a guide for is how far behind they are. So let's say it was a term baby and you do the exam and your circles all fall round, let's make it extreme for a 23, 24 week baby, then you know that their level of hypotonia is much worse than if when you do the exam, it comes out as 36 weeks. In terms of going into much more detail about the Hammersmith, um, that would be a whole lecture on its own. Um, what I would suggest is if you've not used it before, is if you just Google Hammersmith Neuro Exam and then click on images rather than the web search. Um, I think it's the second or third thing that comes up is a guide on how to use the Hammersmith um, and how you can do the more formal scoring, but that's the general principles of how you might use it. Any other questions before I just summarize? Just check there are no others. Okay, so just to summarize, hopefully um, we have gone through how to recognize the floppy infant on examination and bear in mind that you need to do looking at the baby at rest, look at ventral suspension, look at the evidence of head lag, but also take into account their chronological and gestational age. We've developed a logical approach to hypotonia in neonate, so to think about our neuroanatomy from the brain all the way down to the muscle to help you decide if it's central or peripheral and then help you come up with a differential diagnosis. Want to know the common causes of hypotonia, the commonest ones are central and the commonest cause of central is HIE. In terms of understanding how to differentiate central and peripheral causes, we're going to think about strong for central causes, so look for systemic features, evidence of encephalopathy, so tired or lethargic, risk reflexes, micro or macrocephaly, and neurophysiology such as seizures, and G for genetics or dysmorphic features. And if we're thinking a peripheral cause, think weak, so they've got weak or absent reflexes or anti-gravity movements. 
they do have um, an expression in that they're alert and they were facial signs and you want to think about kin so in terms of seeing whether there are any features in the mother or any history and the last part is to understand how to start investigating the floppy baby and i hope that the flow charts will help with that so you first decide if central or peripheral if central your investigations depend on what the most likely cause was so hie think about an mri sepsis think about a septic screen and if it's peripheral you go down the other side of the chart with the most important test being the creatinine kinase first and if the creatinine kinase is abnormal make sure you repeat it and then depending whether the repeat is abnormal or not and whether there's any maternal features that points you down the way to go um, and for those of you that are particularly interested in neonatal neurology, um, two courses I'd recommend, obviously once uh, COVID is over and we're back to having face-to-face -face, uh, courses, um, are both with the BPNA, so there's a neonate neonatal neurology course and there's a distance learning um, that just really help with understanding neonatal neurology and a bit like this talk, so putting it into the basics to make what can be quite complicated, hopefully, seem more straightforward. Thank you very much, guys. Um, that's it. Uh, if you could provide your feedback on the London School of Pediatrics Excel, that would be great. Um, and I have recorded it, so it should get put up onto the London School of Pediatrics site. Thank you very much for all logging in. There was loads of you, so great. Thank you. Thanks, Claire.